you know about that. All right. Hello, hello, hello there. Good evening. So thank you very much for joining us again. Uh, this is another YR. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, David, as well, for joining us. Thanks. It's a real pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> it's our pleasure to have you here. Imagine that. Uh, cool. So on this week's series of webinars, we have David Smith. Is a cloud developer advocate at Microsoft, not, a, not just a developer advocate, but a cloud developer advocate. Uh, and he's going to talk to us about the history of R and Microsoft and also survey a, a little bit the company's products um, that now integrate with R. But then before I ask David to start, I would like to, I would like to thank our sponsor, Jumping Weavers, um, for another episode. So just a little bit about Jumping Rivers, and uh, they are an analytics company with passion for data and machine learning. Uh, and they help companies move from data storage to data insights. They have a new calendar of courses now up on their website, uh, and you can also find them on Twitter. So yeah, so without further ado, uh, David, the floor is yours. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, let me go ahead and share my slides. Um, by the way, for those people that are watching either live or recorded, uh, my slides are available online. Um, if you have a look at down at the little lower left-hand corner of my slide, there's a GitHub repository where I put these slides for people to download and also some links that I'll be referring to during the presentation. So if you can't click on your screen, uh, the links are all there. But uh, once again, thank you so much for the invitation. It's a real pleasure to talk a little bit about the history um, of my time at Microsoft working with R. Um, as uh, you just heard, I'm a what's called a cloud advocate at Microsoft. It's a really interesting job. I've been doing it for about three or four years now. And the role of an advocate is twofold. Uh, one of it is this kind of a thing. It's, it's talking out to communities, letting people know about all the good stuff that Microsoft does and other things like that. Um, but I think the most part of my job goes in the other direction. Uh, my role as the advocate for the R community at Microsoft is to listen to the R community, hear about what you're doing, uh, what's working, what's not working, where you have problems, where things go well. I love to hear about all those kinds of things. So feel, please do feel to react, reach out to me at any time. I've included my uh, email address and my Twitter handle um, on the slide there, and they're all great ways to, uh, to reach out to me. I really love working with the R community. I've been doing that for more than 20 years now. Um, I started off working with S Plus many, many years ago and then switched over to R in the 90s. Um, I'm also a director of the R Consortium, which I'll talk about a little bit during the presentation, uh, which is a trade group um, devoted to supporting the R community. Um, I'm also the co-author of the Introduction to R Manual um, that you get when you download and install R. That's actually an adaptation of some notes that I did with Bill Venables uh, for the S Plus programming language many years ago, but uh, there you have it. Um, and for more than 10 years now, um, I've been the editor uh, of the Revolutions blog, which you can find at blog.revolutionanalytics.com. Uh, lots of history there. Lots of, uh, I use it myself to search for things that I've long forgotten uh, about R, and I do still post there occasionally with updates. Um, so do check that out if you like. So I want to start this little story um, back in 2007. And back then, R was not very well known. Um, it was just in its 1.0 phase. Um, it was fairly well known in academic sectors used for some research, um, but not very well known beyond that. And a, a professor of computing at Yale University was working with the R language and basically recognized that there was a commercial opportunity here. Um, there are many companies out there, of course, doing statistical analyses, forecasting, reporting with proprietary software packages, which were very expensive and unavailable. And Martin, who was the guy that founded Revolution Analytics, thought that perhaps the R programming language would be a useful tool for people at companies 
to be able to do their work with, with, um, uh, with data. So he founded a company which was first called Revolution Computing, ultimately changed its name to Revolution Analytics to commercialize the R language. Now, of course, what does that mean? R is open source software. And the company went through various iterations of providing open source software support to providing commercial add-ons to R to help people work with big data and integrate into databases. And then ultimately uh, working with big companies uh, that were then adopting R for production applications, using R in their routine uh, work processes for doing things like you know, bank reporting or drug discovery, those types of things. So the company um, was founded in 2007, went through many, many years, produced a number of products. Probably the most famous one at that time was Revolution R Enterprise, which was basically open source software with some commercial add-ons to work with big data, which was the big products that Revolution Linux sold to those enterprises. But to get there, the first thing that Revolution Analytics had to do was to make a market for R, because as I said, it wasn't very well known outside of academia at that point. So one of our first jobs at Revolution Analytics was to bring R to the wider world. Um, that was one of my main jobs when I was first recruited to the company was to be a community advocate for R at Revolution Analytics. We did lots of things like putting together the blog that I mentioned, the Revolutions blog, which is still running to this day. By the way, just as an aside, best career move I ever made. Um, the fact that I had to spend a lot of time writing about R, interacting with the community, learning about stories and communicating those stories to the broader world that didn't know about R and often didn't even know about statistics or data management, but was interested in those applications. That really, really taught me a lot personally and really served my career well. So if you're wondering about sort of a tip for getting into a career, um, I recommend blogging because it worked out really well for me, but that's an aside. Another thing that we did to sort of bring R to the front, to the front stage was to work with the media and probably our biggest success was working with the New York Times, uh, which in 2009 published a, a really impactful front page article. And when I say front page, I mean front page of the technology section of the New York Times, but still pretty, pretty cool, um, where they interviewed Ross Ahaka and Robert Jensenman, who were the original founders of the open source R language, interviewed companies that were using R uh, in their work. And this really took things off in terms of bringing the awareness of R to the commercial sector and of how it could be used in place of those commercial alternatives that were really just the, the default at that time. Now, things are very different now. Everybody's using R, everybody knows about R, but at this time, uh, it really wasn't well known at all. But this, this, this article in the New York Times made a big difference. Um, that article, by the way, is still at the New York Times. You can read it and check it out if you want. Just search for that title that you see at the New York Times article and you'll find it there. It's still a good read. Anyway, Revolution Analytics kept on going for, uh, for eight years. Um, we got to some big successes, landed some big clients, brought R to some wide, wider, wider institutions and got the notice of one company in particular, and that was Microsoft. Uh, Microsoft made an approach to buy the company uh, in late 2014. Um, I've got to admit that I was very skeptical at that time of Microsoft getting involved with R. Um, at that time, Microsoft was not well known <laughs> um, for its reputation with respect to open source. Things are very different now. You know, Microsoft is really an open source, source first company, supports many open source foundations and projects. We have thousands of open source developers, but Microsoft did not have a great reputation back in 2014 uh, when it came to open source. So I personally was pretty skeptical about this idea that Microsoft was going to buy a company that was founded around open source. But as part of this process, uh, we got to meet with the engineers, the marketing people, the community people at Microsoft, and just got really, really good vibes about it. It was very clear at that time and still to this day that Microsoft was very focused on bringing its services, particularly the, the nascent cloud Azure, which is now a very big cloud, to any types of commuting problems people might have out there. And you might also remember this was about the time of the big data wave and the data science wave. So this was very good timing and that Microsoft recognized there were all these developers and data scientists out there that had big data sets, had need for big computing, were using R. 
And then Microsoft wanted to facilitate them using R on Microsoft's cloud. And that's really what developed from that. Microsoft did acquire Revolution Linux back in 2015. Uh, we were about 100 people at that time at Revolution Analytics. Uh, Microsoft brought all of us into the company as employees, uh, engineers, uh, marketing people, salespeople, and so forth. And many of them are still with Microsoft today, as indeed I am. It's been uh, over five years now. One of the first things uh, Microsoft did after the acquisition was to be a founding member of the R Consortium. And now the R Consortium is a Linux Foundation project. Uh, so it's an independent nonprofit body um, whose mission is to support R users all around the world. And the reason why it exists is because R use was growing so quickly. There were many, many users out there. Um, a lot of those users were at companies and companies that had a vested interest in the R ecosystem thriving and being successful and continuing to, to grow. And so big companies that were involved in R, um, Microsoft at that time, R Studio, of course, other companies like IBM got together to basically put money into a pot to support the R community. So the way the R consortium works is that platinum members, for example, of which Microsoft is one, uh, donate $100,000 a year which goes into a pool that the R Consortium then gives out to the community through a grants process. Uh, so for example, the R community, uh, so the R Consortium supports R, hundreds of R user groups around the world, um, supports R ladies very significantly and has helped them grow to hundreds of chapters around the world, uh, supports technology projects like R Hub. Uh, if you wanna build a package for R and get it tested on all the platforms that CRAN tests for, you can test it ahead of time in R Hub and help with the CRAN upload and submission process. Also supports events like user, like the video streaming at various users. And basically, if you have an idea for a project, whether it be a community project or a technology project or whatever, you can make a proposal twice a year uh, to the R Consortium for funding for your project. And that may be, might be funding for staff to develop it, might be funding for infrastructure, Whatever you put in your proposal, it's reviewed by a committee um, at the R Consortium and then grants are issued, as I mentioned, twice a year. So if you've got some ideas about what you might, might want to do, check out the R Consortium and it's funded by the companies that are members of it. And as I said, Microsoft was a pioneering, pioneering member of the R Consortium. And then Microsoft has continued to develop its own support for the open source R language. Um, I mentioned uh, Revolution R Enterprise, which was the big product uh, that Revolution Analytics had. Um, that still exists today. It's called Microsoft, um, Microsoft R, uh, which exists as Microsoft R Open, which you can download from a website called MRAN. Um, MRAN also has a really useful feature, which you might even be using yourself and you're not aware of, in that it keeps a snapshot of CRAN and stores it every single day and has done since 2014, I believe. And what that means is it enables reproducibility with R. If you write a script that uses packages, if you give that script to somebody else and then they try to run it, they're probably gonna install packages. But if they run that script six months later, they're gonna get different versions of the packages that you ran it with. And so it might not work because the packages are incompatible or you might get sort of other kinds of errors. What MRAN does for you is provides a time machine for CRAN. It lets that person you give that script to say, give me all the packages that existed as they were when you first wrote that script six months ago. And then you can guarantee that everything will work the same way. Um, that CRAN time machine is also part of the Rocker project. Um, if you're using containers with R, and I'm going to be talking about containers later on in this talk, um, it's likely that you want to put packages into those containers. And again, you would like those packages to be static, so the container itself continues to run. And Rocker works with that CRAN time machine to be able to get packages from any point in time just to support the applications that you deploy with R. There's lots of other things that Microsoft had done with respect to R as well. And I'm gonna um, give an introduction to some of them and then dive down into a couple of them in, in a bit more detail. Um, one very significant one is that R is now embedded within SQL Server. Now, SQL Server is one of Microsoft's flagship products. It is a database that is used very, very widely. And one of the first projects that Microsoft had after the acquisition of Revolution Analytics was to bring R into, 
into that database. The basic idea being, if you're going to be doing an analysis with R on data that exists in, in a database, rather than bring the data out of the database and into R, why not instead bring R into the database and leave the data where it is? Now, SQL Server typically runs on very hefty servers. So that suddenly means you have an R environment, which has lots of RAM and lots of disk space, and of course, access to lots of data through the database. And you can run functions against that data in the database using R, using the architecture that you can see on the screen here. But also had another kind of interesting and, in my view, kind of unexpected side effect is that it also provided a way for IT within organizations to deploy R to a server. So if the IT department had an R script that they need to run on a monthly basis to generate, say, the mortgage exposure forecasts, now rather than having a data scientist do that manually and extract the data and run it on their own machine and make sure the environment for that machine was sufficient, they could instead embed that script directly into the database, which was managed by, managed by IT, approved by IT, and make that part of the standard process like all the other um, stored procedures that people were using with SQL Server for. Now you could do that same process with R, which was a big, big shift and really drove a lot of adoption of R within big organizations that were using SQL Server for these kinds of data workloads. By the way, if you want more information about this or any other things, have a look at the links in the GitHub repository that you can see again there on the lower left-hand side. I provided lots of links to follow up on there. Here's another example of where Microsoft embedded R into one of its major products. Um, you may have heard of Power BI. You might well have used Power BI. Chances are it's in your organization somewhere if you work in a company of just about any size. Um, it's a, uh, it has lots of applications. It's a visualization tool. It's a data ma management tool. But one of the main things it gets used for is dashboarding. Uh, you can create dashboards within Power BI to have a look at the current state of business, accounts, you know, just anything and anything that you can slice up data for and visualize it and then show to people. Um, within Microsoft, we look at Power BI dashboards on a day-by-day -day basis when we're in meetings. All sorts of other companies do as well. But in order to incorporate advanced graphics into those dashboards or advanced statistics, you know, things like forecasts or analyses that are better done in R scripts than in other tools, Microsoft made it possible to embed our graphics and our analytics into Power BI dashboard several years ago, and it's still quite active. And so now a lot of companies that are using Power BI to look at their business and make decisions are doing that at least partially on the basis of graphics and analyses that are done in R that are running behind these Power BI dashboards. Now, of course, the CEOs and CTOs that are looking at these dashboards, they don't realize RA is running in the background but R is being used to drive a lot of the decision-making at big companies because of this types of integration. Again, lots more information about that available in the links. And just, a, and just a, a few other examples to show you. Um, there's a really useful page um, on the Microsoft websites called R in Azure. I think I can click on this and pop it up for you so you can see it. If you wanna have a look at a good overview of all the products uh, within Microsoft where R is embedded and things you can do with it, please take a look at this page and explore what you, you might want to look at. I'm going to go in-depth on Azure Machine Learning Server in just a few minutes, uh, but a few other things you might want to check out are things like the Data Science Virtual Machine. If you want a virtual machine in the cloud that's already pre-configured with R and packages and also other data science tools like Python and Jupyter and so on and so forth, there's a nice data science virtual machine that you can spin up really readily and just get a powerful, you know, essentially laptop in the cloud that you can work on R with. Uh, it's a great thing to check out. Uh, there's a couple of big data tools that Microsoft has, uh, in particular, HD Insight and Databricks, uh, working with very large volumes of data in Spark. Uh, both of those, ha those have R integration in the cloud as well. Um, so you can check those out. Um, you can also do things with Azure Batch. You can also do things with Azure SQL Database, which is SQL Server in the cloud. Lots of other things you can check out you know, right there in that document. And I've also provided some links here in the guide as well. But a few things that I wanna sort of drill down on a little bit further for you to check out. Um, and one of them is Azure R. 
Azure R is a collection of R packages. I think there are about 12 or 13 now, um, which help you manage and interact with services in the Azure cloud directly from an R script. So for example, if from your R function or R scripts, you needed to launch a virtual machine and do some computations on that virtual machine and then extract data from those computations from the cloud storage back into your local environment, you can do those kinds of things with the packages from Azure R. You can also interface with things like the authentication service or the database or generate containers. Um, just, about, just about anything that you can do within Azure infrastructure, you can work with the Azure R um, repositories as well. If you'd like more information about those, um, have a look at the GitHub repo itself. The main Azure R repo is really just an index to all of the other packages, uh, but it's a good way to get an overview of all the packages that exist for you to use. Um, all these packages are also on CRAN, um, so you can just install them as you would any other R package as well. But if you want any details on how any of these work, just go down into the individual repositories uh, to get some extended documentation, examples, and so on and so forth. Really good resources if you're working in the Azure cloud. But one of the examples I wanted to drill in a little bit further is around machine learning operations. Data science, statistical modeling, statistical forecasting is now a very mainstream part of production applications at companies in just about every industry. But over the years, people have figured out processes that help them manage the types of problems that can occur when you have these types of applications uh, in production. Think about the chain of events that occurs when, for example, a data set gets updated. And then a big model needs to be retrained to get updated forecasts. And then that model needs to be updated in the web service, which is in turn connected by the dashboarding system, which is extracting the forecast from the model from the data. So a big chain of events and a big chain of processes is all being connected together because these statistical models and these statistical forecasts developed in R are being used in these production applications. And to address that whole host of issues, sort of a new process has been born. We call it MLOps, machine learning operations. I don't have time in this talk to get into all the details about what MLOps is, uh, but I will refer you to another talk I've given recently that goes into that in more detail if you're interested. But what I wanna show you just in the next you know, five or six minutes is a product that exists in Microsoft uh, called Azure Machine Learning Service that supports processes based on R and Python for machine learning operations, which you can in turn drive uh, with GitHub Actions, which is, which is a new continuous integration service that exists within GitHub. So I'm gonna introduce both of those to you right now just to give an example. Um, it's gonna be motivated uh, by a particular example of, you know, imagine an insurance company that needs to offer um, premiums for car insurance based on, uh, and one of the big factors of that is of course the rate of accidents. And so the uh, data scientists within an insurance company have developed a model to predict the likelihood of accidents given a number of variables, the age of the car, the age of the driver, the speed of the incidents and so forth. And they want to explore that information dynamically as they're talking with actually probably not clients, but probably insurance agents and get that into the system as well. So let's show you how that works. I'm gonna be using uh, a repository that's public that you can play around with. It's this one here in GitHub, Revo David slash MLOps dash R dash GHA. The link again is in the show notes for this, um, which is going to allow me to update my R model. And in this case for the demo, a shiny app that lets me explore that R model directly in GitHub check in the changes, and then have that whole chain of events that I was talking to you about take place so that the model gets updated in the production systems just by checking in a change to GitHub. So let's see that in action. Um, this is the actual Shiny application I wanna show you. I think I have a live version of this running right now. So let me pull that up for you. Where is my window? This one, okay. Okay, so this is a Shiny app that's running on a server. And the whole idea behind it is that I can choose the various parameters associated with this particular incident, the age of the, the vehicle occupants, uh, the gender of the driver, the role of the person, either a driver or a pas passenger, 
the year the vehicle was produced, uh, whether a seatbelt was worn or not, and things like the speed of the impact. And that turns out to be the one that's most significant in determining whether there's a probability of a fatality associated with that model. So what's happening here is I've got a shiny app that lets me specify all the parameters associated with this model. I've already trained a generalized linear model on some historical data that lets me generate a forecasted probability of an accident. And then that's rendered as this bar chart here directly within the shiny app. But the R model that actually produces this probability is running on a dedicated server, which has been deployed through that MLOps process. And so let me show you how that works. Back to my slides. Okay. So to make all this happen, um, I'm working with Azure Machine Learning Service. So Azure Machine Learning Service is a set of cloud services for preparing data, training models, and building models. And what that means is, especially when, when I'm working with very large data sets or very frequent updates to the system, I've got access to an entire cluster of machines in the cloud that let me retrain those models in R at will, and then go through the process of deploying those models back into my systems. So we also have um, tools in both R and Python that let me manage those models and track how accurate they are through experiments and then deploy those models out into the system. And then finally, we have GitHub Actions, which is gonna control the whole MLOps process with code. So that when we change code or when we work in teams and check in changes, a whole continuous integration procedure gets kicked off to update those models in the production systems. If you haven't looked at GitHub Actions, check it out. It's really changed the way that I work with, um, with all sorts of systems in, in particular R. Um, it's pretty easy to get into. Um, there's a lot of details here that are not on this slide, but just the, the TLDR of it is you just need to create some files in a special folder called .github slash workflows in your R project. That defines the conditions when actions happen. For example, a file has changed, you know, perhaps a, a new version of a data file. And then the actions that happen when those things happen, uh, like moving files into a server so they can be processed, kicking off R jobs, uh, launching virtual machines, all those kinds of things you can control through those workflow files. And it gets even easier than that because there's a GitHub Actions Marketplace where you can search for things like, you know, copy a file to a server with SSH. And you get predefined templates that you can use and just fill in all the secrets and things happen really quickly. So you can build them up step by step um, quite easily. Then the way you use those actions is just to check files in to GitHub, for example, or make other changes, and then look at a new tab that exists within your GitHub repository called Actions, which shows you all the jobs that are kicked off and you can see um, if they work and confirm that they do work. And if there are errors, you can drill down into all the log files to see where those errors have happened and go in ahead and fix them uh, really easily. It's a nice, nice system. The application um, of the demo that I just showed you with that Shiny application uh, is as follows. Um, all of the code exists within GitHub um, where there are GitHub actions to control um, other parts of the process. So for example, when I update the R script that defines the GLM model, um, or if the data file is updated, actions get kicked off on a training cluster within the Azure Machine Learning Service with R scripts to update the new model and create a new model object. Then the same thing on the GitHub side, there are actions to work with the Shiny server um, to update the application that I showed you with all, the, with all the, um, the, the parameters and controls. And the same thing with a new model needs to be deployed to the um, server endpoint. That's all handled with GitHub actions as well. I'm going to show you a demo of this um, in a moment and just want to let you know that I'm going to be using Visual Studio Code with Windows Subsystem for Linux. Uh, even though I work at Microsoft, I've always been a Linux person. Um, that's the environment I'm most comfortable in. And now with Windows Subsystem for Linux, I have a complete fully fledged Linux environment directly on my Windows laptop, which I'm using for this laptop, this presentation right now. And then I use Visual Studio Code as my interface into that system. Um, Visual Studio Code is a really nice editor. Um, it does support R, but also lots of other languages as well, and also has first class integration into remote uh, servers through SSH and also the local 
Windows subsystem as well. Um, so that's what I'll be using here. All right, and just to summarize what I'm gonna be doing here, um, actually I've already done this. I've got an, a four node training cluster set up in the Azure Machine Learning Service, which is gonna be using for retraining the models. Um, this is the little snippet of the GitHub action that shows me how I actually set up that cluster. And I'm defining it using a JSON file, which says I want a cluster with a maximum of four nodes and a minimum of zero nodes. Uh, this minimum is really important or really useful anyway, because what that means is after R has done retraining its models, it deallocates all the resources in the cloud that's used for that training. So it doesn't cost me anything. So I only pay for resources while I'm using them for training in the cloud, which is a, a really nice thing to keep costs down. Uh, when I'm training the model, um, again, I'm using a, a GitHub action that's going to specify the, um, the commands that I'm using to, to do that training action. You can see those down here. I'm SSHing into that remote Shiny server, CDing into a directory, exporting out the secrets that I've def defined within GitHub, and then running an R scripts train model.r, which actually retrains the model. And here is the key line within that model, within that file rather. All I'm doing is using uh, what's called an estimator class, which comes from Azure Machine Learning, which is ultimately calling a GLM function in R, which trains that model. <clears throat> and also one of the nice things, I won't demo this right now just for time, is Azure Machine Learning keeps track of all of the models I've ever run. Um, this is up to run 55 in this screenshot, but I can dive in, have a look at the accuracy that I've tracked with each of those models, see how that changes over time. And as I mentioned, if there are errors, I can dive down and have a look at the logs and figure out how to fix them that way too. It's kind of like a reproducibility, reproducibility system built in, keeping track of every action you've ever done. And then finally, once I've got the model trained, I need to deploy it as an endpoint so I can call it out with HTTP pass in all the parameters of that model as JSON, and then return just the prediction, again, as a JSON object. This is all done for me, just with the commands you can see here to deploy an R model as a service. And then those endpoints are also tracked for you within the Azure Machine Learning System. I've gone all over this quite quickly, but you can see all the details in this other repository, which is linked down the bottom left-hand side of my screen here. But the ultimate goal here is to have a Shiny application, which you've just seen, uh, which provides the interface. The Shiny application is not actually doing the model estimation though. That's happening over in a different server in Azure Machine Learning. And I did it that way just to show that it means you can integrate that model into any application. It doesn't have to be Shiny. It could be a desktop application. It could be a mobile application on your phone. Uh, you could actually access R from anywhere through these endpoints that are deployed through the applications. All right, so let me just show you that real quick. Just a quick demo here. What I'm gonna do is go to my GitHub repository, if I can get this little thing out of the way. In my other window, this one here, hopefully. There we go. So here's my GitHub repository. You've got access to this as well. You can clone it and get all the same um, tools you want as well. So here are all the files. I've actually got a, a copy, a sort of a, a, a clone of this GitHub repository on my local environment that I'm editing with Visual Studio Code. Here is the app.r file for the Shiny application we just saw. And here is the code that does the bar plot that you saw on the bar plot. So let me go ahead and change this from being green to let's say um, red, okay. So just change that color specification there in the file. I'm going to save it. I'm going to go over to the GitHub interface, the, the Git interface, commit that file, and give it a check-in uh, check description, red bar. Commit that change, and then sync it back up to GitHub. All right, so if we go back to GitHub now, and I refresh this page. You can see the most recent commit is there, red bar. All right. And if we go into the actions tab, we can see that's kicked off some processes. An action running now called um, tagged by the commit message I used, which was red bar. And that's actually running one of the GitHub actions, which is quick deploy to Shiny server. And what this is doing is updating the app.r file 
on the shiny service, just finished. It copied some files over with SSH, did some checks and so forth. So that now when I go back to my demo here and refresh this page, just by checking in that file to GitHub, the shiny app has been updated and the bar has changed color. And I can do the same process by checking a new data file that will kick off an entire new training process. And I have a new model that was sitting behind the shiny app. Very cool stuff. If you want more details on that, check out that other talk that I mentioned just a minute ago. All right. One last thing I wanna to mention to you real quick and it's brand new. This only got announced yesterday and it's very, very exciting. And that is support for R and other custom runtimes within Azure Functions. If you haven't heard of Azure Functions, same kind of thing as AWS Lambda, this whole idea of you can have serverless applications that spin up on demand, very small applications where you can say, have an R function in the cloud, pass the parameters of those functions to the cloud, and then return the results back to you. And you can have as many of those functions running at the same time as you want, because the service on the back end will spin up as many instances of R as it needs to make that work. Um, this was just announced yesterday, and there is a tutorial already available online uh, for doing exactly this kind of, this kind of stuff in R. Um, basically, what it does for you is sets you up with a container with R and any packages and other dependencies you need for your function. That generates some boilerplate for you, which I won't go into the details of, but it does it. All you need to do is generate a handler in the R language who's going to implement functions. And those functions are going to be, be based on triggers. And those triggers might be an HTTP GET request, or it might be something like um, uh, a queue, a you know, message going into a queue, or it might be a timer for things you want to run as regular cron type jobs. There are all sorts of triggers that you can put behind functions, but when those triggers are triggered, your function gets run and your function gets run in R. Um, the demo, um, which I'll show you in just a minute, is all about setting up the container to support this that includes that handler function and all the other dependencies. And you, all you need to do is push that container to Docker Hub uh, or any other container registry you like. And then that is what is being used to serve the functions within the Azure function system. Um, one of the really neat things about it is you can set things up, and I have done so in that tutorial, so that whenever you push a new version of that container image to Docker Hub in this case, functions will recognize that. It will see that the, the container image has been updated and then automatically update your function accordingly. So it's a real quick and easy way to update functions. And I'll show you how that works uh, just now. So let me go back to Visual Studio Code. I'm actually going to a different workspace for Visual Studio Code. Um, if you follow the directions in the tutorial, you'll set yourself up with a project, something like this. Um, but the bit I want to show you is this handler. Uh, this is just a very simple hello world function in R, as you can see. Um, it's just pasted together the word hello, and then it supports a parameter which might start with name, which you'll, which you'll then include in there. So to show you that in action, I've got this running. You can see this is just a URL into Azure Websites, which is a URL that's created for you by functions. So I can go ahead and reload that and said, indeed, it does say hello world. I can give that a parameter too, name equals wire. And my function code in R is designed to change that message based on that parameter. So this is just a toy example, but you can see you could do anything you like with respect to R. You know, this function could be a statistical model. And in the back end, your handler is running the predict function based on the parameters provided by the endpoints. And it's kind of similarly to what I did with that accident application last time with Azure Machine Learning Service, you could do with functions as well. It just depends what architecture makes sense for your particular application. But I did want to show you this cool little bit here of going into the um, app. Oops, I've got the wrong Visual Studio code here. Just one second. There we go. Going into my uh, handler.r function. Let's change app.r. Okay, I've just saved that file. And then going back to my Linux command line here, let me rebuild the container. This is going to be really quick oh, because I've only uh, because I've only changed the, the R file, all the other layers stay the same. And now let's go ahead and push that container. So that's gone ahead and pushed it back to Docker. And in about one minute, which is going to take to, to recognize that change, 
I can go back to that endpoint and see that it's changed the greetings. But just given time, let me just wrap up my presentation um, just to, to ask the question, you know, what about the future with respect to R at Microsoft? And I just wanted to say it's really, really strong. And the reason for that is simply because of the adoption of R. I think all these things that Microsoft have done with respect to integrating R into Power BI and SQL Server and providing these Azure machine learning support, this is all great for R developers and makes things much easier for people to use the resources that Microsoft provides in conjunction with R. But I do think that the biggest thing that Microsoft has done for R isn't the software. It's the fact that it's made R safe for IT. Now, we all recognize open source. It's a very sort of prominent part of sort of industry today. But for a long time, open source was, was viewed by suspicion by IT organizations. But when five years ago, Microsoft declared it was supporting R in SQL Server and supporting R through its Microsoft R product, that instantly made it palatable and supported from the point of view of IT. And at companies where data scientists had furtively installed R on their laptops and weren't telling IT about it, but nonetheless were supporting these major production applications that turned around basically overnight where IT could say R is official, R is, is supported, we can build entire teams around this. And that really drove the adoption of R in lots and lots of companies. And that's why Microsoft is investing so much going the other direction and making R easy to integrate into their systems just because of the huge opportunity to put it in very commercial terms that Microsoft has with respect to R. Just to wrap up, I think my container push is complete now just to show you that difference. I'm just gonna reload that same endpoint for the function. And just by checking and pushing a new container, my function is updated. Really nice CI CD system for updating containers. All right, well, that's it from me. Thank you so much uh, for allowing me to share all this with you. Uh, as I mentioned already, all the links and uh, are available at that GitHub repository. And with that, I will turn it back to the YR team and for, for, to see if we have any questions. That was so brilliant. Thank you so much, David. Like for real, that was really, really, really good. Excellent. Personally, I did not know that Microsoft had so many um, tools for R and especially the one uh, when you showed the virtual machine with the data analysis, like everything already good out of the box. That's so helpful. Oh, it makes it so easy. That's actually what I use for my Shiny server in my little demo there, because I just have to launch a data science virtual machine. I don't have to install anything else. It's already there. It it's, makes things so easy. And I have a report, uh, college reports to deliver this weekend. And I spent four hours yesterday morning trying to make sure that I had a virtual environment with R running on, on a Jupyter notebook. So I could write a report. <laughs> so brilliant. Yeah. Thank, thank you so much. But now there's so many questions as well. Oh, great. <laughs> Hit me with them. Cool. So uh, let's start with, are there any plans for Docker integration with MRAN? Are there any plans for Docker integration with MRAN? Well, that's actually kind of already happened. Um, if you have a look at the Rocker project, R-O-C-K-E-R, um, this is a project led by Dirk Edebutel and several others, uh, basically providing the standardized containers for R. Um, a lot of the tags that you use for Rocker, I think you can even provide a date as the tags, and that actually pull the historic snapshots of CRAN as your packages into that container for you. That is super cool. Okay, well, thank you. Um, how many cores are available by default on the Revo Microsoft version of R? Um, so if you're talking about installing Microsoft R in a local environment, um, it's not limited by the number of cores. Um, so I'm not really sure what the question is. I didn't, and I'm, to be honest, I very rarely run big jobs of R on my local machine anymore. Um, I always spin up a virtual machine or use one of the services. And of course, in that environment, you can have anything from four cores up to you know, 128 cores and terabytes of RAM. So I, I, I just don't think that way anymore, to be quite honest about how many um, things I run in my local environment, because I do everything in the cloud these days. 
I think the question was exactly that was like how many cores are available on the virtual machines. Oh, got it. Yeah. And that's there are all sorts of different sizes of, of virtual machine you can have. And of course, the bigger you get, the more expensive it is in terms of, you know, dollars per minute kind of a thing. Um, but I tend to prototype on a small virtual machine. And then when I hand it off to a production team, they would typically run around one of the big virtual machines. Cool. Thank you. Uh, so how often do you use Power BI personally? versus how often would you catch yourself wanting to build a shiny one? <laughs> that, that's a really good question. I, I don't build Power BI personally myself. I'm not very good at it. <laughs> um, but I have contributed um, charts and R analyses that other people have built into work into, into uh, dashboards for me. And to be honest, like I, as, as I mentioned, I use dashboards all the time. And for all I know, there's all sorts of R happening in the background of them for like when I have a look at Azure reports and things like that. But other teams are doing that, so I'm not quite sure. Um, as you saw in this example, I built a Shiny app because that's my skill set. If I want to build an interactive application, I'm going to use Shiny because that's what I know. Uh, but I do want to reemphasize that it doesn't have to be Shiny. When you deploy an R application as a function or as an endpoint in a virtual machine or as an Azure machine learning, any type of application can take advantage of that. It doesn't have to be Shiny. It could be desktop, it could be R, it could be C, it could be F sharp, it could be anything. And this is, this is how things are happening now that R is getting integrated into all sorts of systems through these types of integrations and where people don't even know. And that's a great thing. Yes, I completely agree. Well, thank you. Uh, great answer. Then uh, Dasla is asking, what's the biggest benefit of Power BI when compared to Tableau? You know how to answer this one? Yeah, I, I, I'm not really authorized to answer that in the sense that I don't use Tableau and I haven't for many, many years. But I know they're very similar types of applications, Power BI and Tableau. I think Tableau has some R integration as well. So it probably depends on what your IT infrastructure supports, what you have available. Um, of course, the people that I work with I work with Microsoft, so I tend to work with Microsoft people and clients. So it tends to be Power BI in those types of situations. And of course, Power BI is integrated in with the whole Microsoft suite. You know, not just R, but Excel, SQL Server, you name it. So if, if people are in a Microsoft environment, they're probably using Power BI just because of those integrations. Cool, thank you. And then another Power BI question for you. So any efforts to embed R in Power BI for transformations in addition to visuals in the online environment and not just Power BI desktop without requiring a personal gateway? Ah, that's one I'm going to have to get back to you on. I haven't checked into that in quite a while. Okay. Um, I th they, they did introduce quite a while ago the ability to do R transformations on the local version of Power BI that's installed on the desktop. Um, the question is referring to Power BI Online, which is basically a cloud hosted version of Power BI where you don't need to have it installed on your desktop. And I actually thought they had set it up so you could run uh, transformations in that cloud environment now, but I'm gonna have to check on that. I haven't in a while and see if that's still the case. But uh, if the person that asked that question wants to reach out to me via email, I can follow up that way. Perfect. Okay, so well, you, you heard David, <laughs> wonderful, thank you. Um... So there are a few comments saying that um, the integration of VS Code and WSL are quite impressive. Um, so thank you as well for commenting on that. Um, what was the- And actually, but just on that point, I want to say like, if I'm doing if I'm doing 100% R, if I'm just doing an analysis in R, I still do that in R Studio. Um, R Studio is, is an amazing editor for R, amazing IDE. Um, but I tend to find myself using WS, um, Visual Studio Code more and more because I'm doing so much more in WSL, because I'm doing so much more integration with other languages than R and having it all in the one place, uh, I found really, really helpful. And the R support in WSL, sorry, the R support in Visual Studio Code is getting better and better. There's um, some really nice features in there now, mm. uh, contributed by the community. Cool. I haven't used, I haven't used uh, R with VS Code. I use WSL. Uh, when I was using Windows and was actually quite good. The only thing I have to say is uh, do not set your root folder uh, on the cloud. So I was using Google Cloud at that time. Yeah. And if you set your root folder for a Google for like in the cloud, it's 
it's a little bit of overhead. Yeah. You mean your root photo folder for Visual Studio Code or the root no. folder for something else? For WSL. So your root folder in WSL being inside. Oh, I see. Like it was like a, a, a directory that was synced to the cloud or something like that. Gotcha. Yeah. So yeah. that doesn't work that well. But the rest yeah. is thing. Like it's really cool. It, and it runs Linux code very well. Yeah. The other thing I would recommend is WSL2 is out now. Um, which is a little bit of a different architecture behind the scenes. But one of the things that does make a lot faster, well, actually there's two important things, at least for me with respect to WSL. Uh, number one, WSL2 supports Docker. So if you want to run containers, like Linux containers directly on your Windows machine, um, take a look at WSL2. Like all that stuff I showed you about editing code, building containers, pushing containers, that's just all with Docker running in Linux. And that was enabled with... Uh, WSL2. Um, the other thing that WSL2 does, it makes file operations a lot faster. Uh, in the old WSL, like just syncing a Git repo could be quite slow. And that might be the thing you're experiencing too. If it's doing, if, if it used to do lots of operations with files, it could be quite slow. But this change of architecture with WSL2 makes it just as fast as a native Linux box, because that's essentially what it is. And so it's super fast now. Mm, you're making me rethink. I'm about to, ins to, to install a Nike Linux distribution of, on my new computer. You're making me rethinking it. Yeah, I'll give it a go in WSL2 because you can just install Ubuntu 20 directly from the Microsoft Store and you're good to go. <laughs> you were, it was a great surprise to see that. Yeah, yeah, it was really good. Oh, well, thank you so much. Uh, we're out of questions from um, the attendees right now, but I have a few questions for you. Sure. Uh, so, as a developer advocate, um, you, you usually you used to work to, to travel a lot, right, for work. How is COVID being for you? That like classic. It's been a big change. Uh, I I used to travel a lot, a lot. I was out of, I was away from home three weeks out of four for much of the year. So the, <laughs> this whole COVID situation has really changed my life in a quite profound way. Um, this is literally the longest time in my life that I've been without going to an airport. But we've definitely had to change our practices. Like the way that we connect with communities has dramatically changed from being obviously in person uh, to being online. And there are pluses and minuses. Um, obviously being online, we can reach out to more people. Like it's no problem for me to be at a meetup in Poland these days because I can do it from this very chair. So. In that sense, it's been great being able to reach out to so many more people. Uh, I do feel like the personal connection is really important though. And you know, having these kinds of conversations that we're having now, um, having that direct interaction is, is such an important part of traveling and going to these events that you don't realize how important it is until it's gone. <laughs> and so now our entire team at Microsoft and I'm sure advocacy teams in all companies are exploring different kinds of ways of not just communicating online, but interacting with people online. Um, there was a really cool example. I saw one of my colleagues uh, at work, Emily Walker, that uh, works in gaming. Um, they developed basically a version of NetHack, you know, the Rogue, the little sort of online game that everybody could join. And this was the way of basically having the conference space where people could move around in this little text-based, sort of representation of a world and meet with people and stuff. And it was really cool. And I just, it's really interesting the way that people are exploring now in how in this online environment, we can still make those serendipitous connections. Uh, and, and it's fascinating. Yes, I totally agree with you. Uh, so, but you don't miss the jet lag though. You know, I do. <laughs> I love traveling. I love planes. I can sleep really well on planes. Yep. And honestly, that's actually been a big, uh, this is getting off topic, but this has been a big impact for me was I didn't realize how much for me personally, traveling was my downtime. Traveling was the opportunity I had to relax, to read a book, to get some sleep, to watch some movies. You know, I did all that kind of stuff on planes. And now that I'm not traveling at all, I just find myself, I'm working, you know, nonstop and it's exhausting. <laughs> so I've really got to consciously put some time into my schedule just to relax a bit because it's a, uh, I'm finding I'm just working a lot harder now that I don't have that downtime. <laughs> yes, that is so 
interesting because uh, for most developer advocates now they're like yeah um like it's very different um we're feeling it's like there's the different on everything but we don't miss the chat like you're the first one that i talked to that is actually missing the 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 jet lag so okay. <laughs> Jet lag is a good excuse just to hole up in a hotel room for eight hours and I don't get that anymore. <laughs> we're live. You do know we're live, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so Rafa, I'm going to have to back off a little bit because Rafa asked, us, asked me to ask you another question. Sure. Uh, so, David, what do you think about the future of Revo uh, Scale R slash SQL Server, ML, service, ML Services? especially for those unable to move to the cloud. Should new customers be still looking at it or go open source? Yeah, that, that's, that's a really interesting question and a big question. But in general, um, just for context for, for other people that not, might not be aware, Revo Scalar was a package that was developed by Revolution Analytics that implemented some specialized implementations of algorithms like GLM that work with big data. Um, it was never released as open source. It was always proprietary because that was the business model for Revolution Analytics to basically, that was how they made their money was by selling the, this proprietary add-on to R. Honestly, I think times have passed since then. Um, I think open source has caught up, first of all. There are plenty of good open source libraries in Spark, for example, uh, to be able to do GLMs on very, very large data sets. Technology has caught up. You know, now the fact that we can spin up a, a virtual machine in the cloud with, you know, four terabytes of RAM, you know, these constraints with big data and R just don't exist anymore. Um, we still have clients using Revo Scalar in production, so Microsoft still supports it. But if I was speaking to a brand new person, uh, a new R user today who was thinking about, I need to do R, I need to do big data. Personally, I would steer them towards just stick with open source. Um, there's plenty of open source. Our libraries or libraries in other systems for doing analytics with big data. And you can run those in the cloud. And Microsoft will be very happy when you run those in the cloud on open source. <laughs> awesome. Thank you for that. Now we have a few, just a few minutes left. So I have two uh, final questions for you. So first of all, is there any, like if I want to train on that deployment on Azure, uh, if I want to use Azure for experimentation, is yeah. Is there any um, budget that Azure offers to new users? Or like how? Yes, there definitely is. Um, if you go to azure.com slash free, azure.com slash F-R-E-E, -E, uh, any new subscriber to Azure will immediately get $200 in Azure credits uh, to use for anything. Um, so if you haven't tried Azure before, go and grab those credits. Um, launch Azure Machine Learning. Um, play around if you're careful and make sure you set your cluster sizes to scale down to zero and delete any endpoints you create after you use them, you can keep your costs very low and that $200 will last you quite a while as you are experimenting. Awesome, thank you, very good. Now, the last question is gonna be related to Jupyter Notebooks. So I've heard that uh, Jupyter Notebook, um, Azure Notebooks supported R on Jupyter Notebooks and you could run that online. You could run it on the cloud. But then I heard about that uh, Azure Notebooks got deactivated and I also got a complaint from one of your <laughs> most avid users, I would say. Yeah. Uh, do you have any news on what's the future on that if you're planning to be? Yeah, um, the future of Azure Notebooks is now Azure Machine Learning. So Azure Machine Learning, one of the concepts it has is a uh, compute environment, I think that's right which is basically your own development environments where you do, you write your code and run your models in uh, prototyping. Um, that supports Jupyter Notebooks, just like Azure Notebooks used to. Um, in fact, it's even better because you can have lots of, you can have your own custom kernels. It supports lots of different R versions. Um, so you can run those same Jupyter Notebooks you did run in Azure Notebooks within the Azure Machine Learning Service. Wonderful. Well, thank you. So you see, Kevin, do not be, do not be um, mad anymore because they're there. They're back there. <laughs> very good. And they can be used again. Absolutely. Very, very cool. Thank you so much, David. It was an absolute pleasure to have you here today. Thank you for your talk. And It really was. Thank you for having me. It's been real fun. I really enjoyed the chats. So that's been great. <laughs> cool. Thank you. And All right. And thanks, everybody, for watching. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, David said everything then. So.
Thank you very much, and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Right. <laughs> Bye-bye.